turning this evening to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 5, and verse 8. And our subject this evening is a humbling encounter with the Lord. A humbling encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8 reads, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. If we read the four Gospels, we read four different accounts of the call of some of the disciples, Peter being one of them. And it's clear that when the Lord called his disciples, at least some of them were called more than once. Peter, as he is known, received that name on his first encounter with Christ, introduced by his brother Andrew. And the Lord said to him, you are Simon, but you will be called Cephas or Peter, a rock. He was introduced in John chapter 1 to the Lamb of God, so announced by John the Baptist, whose disciples they had been. But here is another call that the Lord Jesus gives to Peter, and it is the call to service. And this is part of our Christian conversion. The Lord often calls us and has to call us more than once. We are called first perhaps to see him as the saviour, to understand his work, to make a discovery of him in the way that Peter did. Then we have to have that call to salvation, to understand the way in which the Lord has provided for our pardon. He invites us to faith, to trust in him, and gives us that faith. But then there is the call to service. And that is what we see here narrated in the life of Peter. Let me ask this question of us each. Have we received that call to service? It's important that we understand that the Lord Jesus doesn't simply call us to trust him with our soul and to find forgiveness of sin. That's vital. That's precious. He doesn't simply call us to receive from him a new life with new understanding and desire, a new reality within our heart. He calls us to service. Every one of us here this evening, if we are true Christians, the Lord has called us to serve him. Do we remember that? That we are called to follow him and to serve him. This is clearly a memorable event in the life of Peter. Not simply because it was a call to serve, but because of the deep impression this encounter with Christ made upon him. In fact, if you look at verse 8, it speaks of Simon Peter. Earlier in the chapter, he's referred to simply as Simon. But here, perhaps because Peter narrated these things and made them known to Luke, his full title is given. It's almost a confession of his faith. His full title is also used by Matthew. When you may remember, Simon Peter in answer to the question, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am, says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This was a pivotal moment in Peter's true experience of Christ. And it was etched upon his memory. And it shaped him from this moment onwards. It led him to exclaim here his encounter with Christ Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O God. And yet, 
many who profess Christ, particularly today, seem to have never come close to this experience that Peter had in his own life. And yet, up to a point, this is an, a, a vital part of true Christian conversion. We may not have the overwhelming sense of wretchedness that Peter speaks of here, but true Christianity always includes a knowledge of ourselves and of our unworthiness before God. Have you had that? You may not have such a pivotal moment as Simon Peter had here, but has the Lord in some way imparted to you and to me a sense of our utter unworthiness in his sight and in his presence? Well, what was it that provoked such a reaction in Simon Peter as is recorded here in this verse? I want to focus upon his words, his response, just for a moment, because these words can be uttered in three different ways. Firstly, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, is sometimes, if not openly stated, the inward attitude of many unbelievers. It's a casual recognition that they are sinful and Christ is holy. They're prepared to acknowledge that much. But their response, their language, if it is this language, is something like this, depart from me. I wish to remain as I am. I don't want the Holy One to draw near to me and to interfere with my enjoyment of my sin. I freely admit I am a sinner, and I find the presence of Christ uncomfortable and intimidating, and I find the presence of Christ's people likewise making me uneasy, and the preaching of Christ's word annoys me. Depart from me. I do hope that there are none here this evening who inwardly that's how we feel about the Lord Jesus Christ. I would rather there was considerable space between me and the Lord. How tragic if that is our state. How we have misread the Lord. He is the God of all grace and salvation. He is wise. He is able to bless us with joy and peace and happiness and hope far beyond what we shall ever find in this world. But, of course, that is not how Simon Peter is speaking. It's not the spirit of this disciple of Jesus Christ when he makes this statement here, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He is filled with awe. He admires the Saviour. In one sense, he desires the friendship and the presence of Christ in his life, and yet he feels wholly unworthy to be in the very presence of this holy Son of God. But what led to this exclamation? Why was there this outburst of emotion and remorse and shame at this particular juncture in Peter's encounter with Christ. There are two things. Firstly, he had an overwhelming sense of the majesty of Christ. And secondly, he had an overwhelming sense of his own deep sinfulness. It will be a wonderful thing if the Lord imparts that same sense to our hearts this evening. Of course, for Peter, this was what we may say an in-the-flesh experience. He was in the physical presence of Christ whilst he was here upon earth. And Peter uh, and Christ came into his, his boat 
in which Christ performed this miracle with the fish. It was with his knowledge and experience as a fisherman that he was impressed by this remarkable encounter and miracle. Of course, Christ does not enter in a physical way into our life in the way that Peter was so favored here. But the Lord does enter our world when he calls us by his grace and when he blesses us with the knowledge of himself. He often interferes in our circumstances. It may frustrate us. He may appear for us to deliver us from great difficulty or danger. He may thwart our plans because he knows that we are rushing headlong into a worldly way of life. But above all, the Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself to us and impresses his majesty upon us and our sinful state upon us through his word. Applied to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's as we read it. It's as the word of God is preached in our hearing and God by his spirit touches our hearts that we may have the same overwhelming sense of the reality of Christ and our sinfulness that Peter could speak of here. Well, what was it that Peter witnessed of Christ? I hardly need to take you through the narrative. It's so straightforward in one sense, isn't it? But notice in verse 4, his penetrating knowledge. This was almost certainly the middle of the day. And he instructs Simon to launch out into the deep. If you want to catch fish, you don't try in the middle of the day. And you don't go into the deeper waters. And yet the Lord, because he is the mighty son of God, has that perfect knowledge of the location of these shoals and directs Peter accordingly. It confounds Peter's own experience as a fisherman. And he comes to realize that he is, in de he is dealing with the Son of God, who had a perfect knowledge not simply of fish, but of all men and of his own heart. There was nothing hidden from the Son of God. All the secrets of his thoughts and desires, his attitudes, his doubts, they were all naked and open, just as the depths of the Sea of Galilee were open to this master in whose presence he was. It impressed him with the majesty of this man. Did you know that the word master used in this passage is a word that does not imply any personal relationship? It simply means one who is a teacher. But in verse 8, we see that, the, that Peter now falls at the knees of Christ. Probably he is sitting in the boat, which is why Luke here speaks of Peter falling at the knees of Christ. And he calls him Lord. He's now exalted in the esteem of this new disciple. He's no longer simply a generic master, but he is the son of God. And he knows that his whole life is naked and opened before the one with whom he has to do. Has the Lord so drawn near to us and impressed upon us that Christ has a perfect penetrating knowledge of our own hearts? He knows us through and through. How humbling that would be if we realized it. But then we see here that he has power over all creatures. Peter knows as a seasoned fisherman, the fish would not normally be in those deep waters at the height of the day. But by the power of God, those 
creatures can be moved just where Peter is to let down his net. It must have impressed him. It's the power of Christ that moves the heart to seek him. This would be a profound lesson for Peter as he went forward later to catch men, to know that in one sense he was but a mere instrument, having no more power than the net. The power was God's that brought souls to salvation. And if you and I are saved this evening, it's through the power of Christ. And it's his power that we need, extending into our hearts and lives, drawing us to himself as those fish were drawn to Peter's net. But his, we read here, verse 9, the reason, in one sense, you could say, Pastor, you could have just read verse 9, and then we would know why Peter fell down at, at the Saviour's feet. He was astonished, we read, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. This word, astonished, it means to be captivated with awe, to a wonder held him all around. Can you imagine the scene? Peter now is overwhelmingly convinced that those fish are there because of the presence of Christ in his boat. But this was not the only overwhelming sense that Peter had when this verse was uttered. He saw the majesty of the Redeemer, but at the same time he had an overwhelming sense of his own sin. There's no particular sin mentioned here. But what brought these words from Peter's mouth? Well, in verse 5, we see that he had conducted himself with great self-confidence and pride. Simon answering said unto the master, unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. We must give him credit that he had enough esteem for the Saviour here to defer to his command, despite it being against his own instincts. Nevertheless, there's clearly a protestation here on the part of Simon. I'm the fisherman, you are the carpenter. I know these waters as well as the back of my hand. I know the art, the skill of catching fish. And you're telling me at this hour of the day to go into these deep waters and expect success. This was Peter expressing his own self-confidence and pride in his own competence. But are not these sins which we are all guilty of too? Not necessarily in the field of fishing, but this is the instinctive reaction of every one of our hearts when exposed to God's word, Christ's word. By nature, we object to his word. We question his standards. And we find fault with his sovereign decree and will. We say, who is Christ to interfere in my life? Who is this God who demands that I live in a certain way and tells me it's good for me and it's best? I don't accept that. You see, this is part of our self-confident, proud nature. We do not want to fall under the counsel of God's word. We think we know what is best for us and how best to manage our lives. Perhaps some of us here this evening, that's what we're thinking within. I see no point in hearing the word of God, in learning of Christ. I see much more point in devoting myself and indulging to all the pleasures of this world. Children, you think like this? Young people, it's how by nature we think, we, we despise 
the teaching of Christ and his good counsel to us. Just as Peter resented the master here and the counsel he gave that said, go fishing. No, Lord, come on. This is not right. And we think that we are worldly wise and street wise and we know how to conduct ourselves in life. And we do not need the Son of God to tell us how we should live, how we should think. We're dismissive of his great work at Calvary. What point was there in it? What sense? We may not say that openly. But if we do not approve the work of Calvary, if we do not esteem Christ for what he has done, then in one sense, in proud conceit, we are saying, I see no point in the work that Christ has accomplished. It seems strange to me. We question his prescribed solution to our deepest needs. That call to repentance, to forsake our old life of sin, to ignore the, the alluring things of this world and humble ourselves before him and trust our souls to his redeeming blood. These things are alien to us and we feel that we know better than our saviour. I hope none of us do think like this tonight, but it's the natural seedbed of our thoughts unless the Lord humbles us and draws near. Peter is now confronted not only with the power and wisdom of the Lord, but he's overwhelmed by a realisation of his own wretchedness and unworthiness as never before. He realises that the Lord reads his heart. The Lord knows that he has questioned the advice that the Lord has given to him, the command. He knows that the Lord sees his doubts, his cynicism, his lack of confidence in the word of Christ, and he feels utterly ashamed of himself. He says, I am a sinful man, O Lord. He does not mention one specific sin, but his general fallen state is brought in array before his mind. He's been betrayed by the attitudes and the words that he has so recently spoken. But he realizes above all that he is unworthy to be in the presence of such majesty. Friends, that's what we need ourselves, isn't it? To realize that the Son of God, in all his holy purity and majesty and wisdom and power and knowledge, his holy character, how can we in all our pride and wretchedness with all our harsh thoughts that we have entertained over the years that the Lord sees and knows, how can we possibly dwell in the presence of such a saviour? When he says here, depart from me, this is not the word I'm sure we realise of one who despises Christ, but rather it's the language of one who, though he longs to be in the presence of Christ, cannot bear the thought that Christ should see him as he is and know him in the deep reality of his sin and wretchedness. It's so vital that we see ourselves as Peter saw himself here. We cannot truly find peace with God whilst we have high views of ourselves. But you know, this can be a real stumbling block when we're seeking the Saviour. We think, well, I am such a sinner. My best thoughts and desires are still stained with sin. 
My all is worthless. How can I then presume that the Saviour will receive me? And that brings me to the third thing about this statement here. It was a statement made because Peter had had an overwhelming sense of the majesty of Christ and an overwhelming sense of his own sin. But it was also a request that he made because he had a misunderstanding of the Saviour. The Lord received sinners. It was at this very point when, Christ, when Peter humbles himself into the dust that the Lord speaks fear not to him. It's at this point that Peter is fit for the service of the Saviour. And he says, from henceforth, you will catch men. I can use you, Peter. I couldn't use you before. You were too proud. You were too self-confident. And yes, those traits will still be with you. But at least now you know that you are unworthy and you are wretched. And we need that, friends. If we are to find the Lord's forgiveness, if he is to speak fear not to our souls, then we must come empty-handed, realizing our nakedness and our worthlessness before him. Then he will receive us, just as he speaks words of comfort to Peter here. It's those who feel with shame their great unworthiness. They are the very souls that the Lord delights to pardon and receive. Come to Christ owning your state. Tell him you are unworthy to be in his presence, that, you should, that he should depart from you because you are so unworthy, but then fall at his knees. Peter discovered that he was a forgiving Lord. How overwhelming it must have been when the Lord says to him, fear not, Peter. Yes, Peter, I'm everything that you now realize I am. I have that penetrating knowledge of your heart and your character. I have that power to move men as I move fish. But fear not, Peter. I am the saviour. Peter would later discover in greater depth the way of salvation. We have the advantage that Christ has now finished his work. He's offered himself at Calvary. But more than that, he has lived a complete life from beginning to end of perfect righteousness. His thought life, his motives, his desires, his love for the things of God. Everything about Christ as a man was a life that was filled with perfection, such that he was well-pleasing to God in heaven. He gave up that life. Peter would understand that though he was unworthy, he was wretched and sin-stained, yet his saviour, the very man in whose presence he was, was the only one that could supply all the defects in Peter's character and life. It was the perfect life that he lived but laid down that is provided to you and to me. In one sense, we say, Lord, I, desire, I deserve that you should depart from me. And yet the Lord says, no, I will receive you and I will clothe you with my obedience so that not only will you be received by me, but received by my Father in heaven. What a wonderful saviour is set before us here. Notice the reaction to these words of tenderness that flow from the Lord in response to Peter's confession. I am a sinful man. We read verse 11. When they had brought the, their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. If we are so moved, and if Christ 
in his grace and mercy, blesses us with his forgiveness, then this is the only fitting response to follow in the path of true discipleship, as Peter did here. They forsook all and followed him. We are not all called to leave our callings literally. Some are. To be full time in the service of the Saviour. But we are all, too, called to leave our loyalty and our devotion to the old way of life. We have our callings here, but we know that they must come second. Our first calling is to serve the Saviour and to follow him and to be of use to him. Are you ready for that call to say from now on, from henceforth, the first priority in my life is to labour for the Lord Jesus Christ out of love and gratitude for what he has done for my soul. Why was there such a large hole? I'll close with this. Why was there such a large hole? Of course, it advertised and underlined the majesty and power of Christ. But there may well have been another purpose. What did they do with these fish? Well, in one sense, they forsook them. Even though the Lord weighed down their boats with a vast haul and all the worth that that could generate, they forsook it in one sense. But I'm sure those fish were not left on the, on the beach to rot. They were sold. And perhaps they provided a great income for their families. From this moment, Peter and James and John and Andrew had left their father and they would serve the Saviour in full-time discipleship. But the Lord had provided for their wives and for their families such that in the meantime they would not lose out. And those who serve the Saviour, they may have to forfeit many opportunities in this world, but the Lord will always provide for those that put him first. Well, may the Lord bless these things to us and move us each to a deep sense of our own sinfulness and stir our hearts that we may be pre-prepared to leave our old loyalties to serve him as our Lord and Saviour. Our closing hymn is 